in scenes not seen in the Russian-Ukraine war since the opening round in February of 2022, Ukrainian civilians are fleeing the battlefield ahead of a Russian onslaught. You may recall that in the opening, uh, literal, a few first few days of the war, when Russian tanks were flying in across the border in four or five different locations, that there were Ukrainian civilians fleeing the battlefield left and right. Now then, in the area of Pokrovsk on the eastern front, a new exodus has begun where Ukrainian folks are, are fleeing to the west to try to escape the oncoming Russians. And Russia has, has also been uh, escalating its advances in the east at a rate also that's shocking many in the west. And this is some of the big supporters of the Ukraine side uh, at the speed with which it's happening. And as, as we've been talking, this is not happening in a vacuum. There's reasons for this, and it's only likely to accelerate in the coming days. One of the only limiting factors may be the ability of Russia to continue to pursue and to continue its pace of operations, which it's been doing for quite a while now. Uh, it's unknown. We, it, evidence appears that they will be. But if not for that, you can expect this pace to either maintain or possibly even accelerate as the Ukrainian defenses continue to crumble. And there's reasons for that. Uh, I, I want to look at uh, actually what's going on specifically in the Pokrovsk area. This is a, a map here of what's going on in the Pokrovsk. We've talked about this a lot, and I'm going to show you a, literally a time-lapse uh, video here in just a second that, that graphically depicts how fast Russia is penetrating in. But you see that there in the far right side, you see the city called Evdivka, and then you see Ochertina, and then uh, Novohrodivka in the far left there. There's one right after the other. These are all relatively medium or, or large size uh, towns and, and cities that Russia has taken. In the far upper left-hand corner, you see the city of Pokrovsk. And, and for all those who may not have seen our, our earlier videos, that is uh, probably the most important city on the entire eastern front for Ukraine to hold and for Russia to take. And the reason is because, and I'm going to show you a map here in a minute, uh, pulling back a little bit from this, but you see Pokrovsk has seven road or rail network lines coming out of it. It is basically the entire hub of the Eastern Front for the Ukraine side, which they need to supply all of their forces north and south of this, as well as in the specific area there. And if Ukraine uh, it loses this city, or, or even if once Russia gets close enough to where they can take it all under uh, normal artillery and drone uh, range, then it's going to significantly complicate anything the Ukraine side can do to move forces around, uh, to move reinforcements in, or even to, to merely uh, e equip its troops to, to give them ammunition, food, water, all the things you need to sustain just daily operations, or to move medical supplies in and out, to move wounded uh, out, and to bring reinforcements in. All of these things are dependent on what happens at Pokrovsk. And that the 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 pace with which they've been losing is already going up very high with Pokrovsk and with all of those networks. You can only imagine how much harder it's going to be to maintain these operations in the east if they don't have this major major uh, uh, nodal network here or, or they have road and rail. Uh, but that's not the only place that's, that's have given the Ukraine side problems and why people are fleeing. There's also the Toretsk area. And if you, Gary, if you can put that map up, you see. Also, so there's Pokrovsk in the middle. We showed you the close up a second ago. And then there's Toretsk in the northern part. And that's another major city that Russia has been trying to take for quite some time. And it's one of three separate nodes. And there's actually quite a few that is happening on the Eastern Front. In fact, that's actually one of the bigger concerns on the Ukraine side, that it's not just uh, the, the Pokrovsk and the Toretsk area, but uh, there's a new ones being added, uh, Vugladar in the south, south beyond what this map can show right here. I'll again pop out in just a second. But at, at first, actually for months now, you've been able to pretty well tell where Russia was going. Then there's three or four different areas where they were putting pressure on and making progress. But those are starting to now meld together because Russia is generally almost all along the line of contact starting to move forward. Uh, and let me actually show you a, a map here uh, of exactly where a lot of these things are coming from uh, and, and show you that Vugladar area as well. Uh, because so th this right here is the 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 uh, 
a Pokrovsk area that I just showed you that one map here. This this big bulge that's sticking into the, the Ukraine line. And and there is the city of Pokrovsk right here. That And you can see all these roads that are coming out of it and why it's so crucial. But let me back off and show you a little bit more because this right here is what keeps their troops here. Uh, here and down here and all the way down here they this everything comes in from the from the east and then it gets distributed and moved around here and without this it is much much more difficult to, to keep all of these things uh supplied in the uh, uh, especially in the Pokrovsk area there's a, a bigger danger in this area right here uh in that instead of Russia has been making these moves here but they've also been uh pushing out on the flanks so that Ukraine doesn't have a chance to cut this off and it's similar to what the russians may be trying to do in the Korsk area up in the north more on that in a minute but there are many ukrainian units in this area right here all along this line of contact uh this particular map doesn't show the ukraine uh an enemy or a, a unit positions or the russian positions these blue and red dots by the way this represents where uh actions are taking place where attacks are made where bombs are falling etc but there's a bunch of ukraine troops in here Russia is pushing out in this area in the areas right here. Uh, according to some mappers I've seen this morning, this town called Ukrainsk here has already fallen today. So this, this map was made yesterday. And you see already since today, just hours ago, this city may also be involved. So this probably is now in the Russian side here, which means all of these Russian or Ukraine troops in here are going to be at risk of being cut off. And so they're going to have to come to a decision point very soon to where they either withdraw all of their troops from here back to lines where they can defend back in these other areas where these other villages are, or they could literally get them cut off. Because if Russia moves in from here and starts to turn this way, at the same time they move here in a pincer movement, which Russia has been doing a lot of in the last several months, especially the last half of the year, then all of this is at risk. And if Ukraine has to move all these troops out, you see it'll be an even bigger gain in, in that area there. And uh, Gary, if I could, if we could uh, roll back, I want to show people just how fast this has been going on. After a lot of positional warfare, especially for uh, most of the first half of this year, now then, what you're seeing here is an animated drawing of the Pokrovsk area as it evolved over a 90-day time lapse. So this is just 90 days. You see that Russia has methodically been moving in this direction. <clears throat> and, and uh, you know, some of the moves are coming faster and faster as the, the time gets closer. And you see, this is the reason why in that opening scene, you saw that all the civilians are starting to flee from Pokrovsk because they see this relentless move by the Russians in their direction. And so they know for sure they're aware of how important that strategic town is to the entire operations in the east. Now, of course, this is coming uh, at a time. Let me run back to that map here. Uh, because this is coming at a time when, when Ukraine is really suffering all over the place. It's like, you know, kind of like the, the classic uh, boy from Holland and the finger in the dock. Where, where do you send your troops? Because Ukraine uh, already pulled troops from some of these areas in order to fight in the Kursk area up in the north here. And so these are some of the areas where we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now where Ukraine has moved in there. And, and you can see in this map here, you, Ukraine had a little bit of success going up this road here and a couple of other places here recently. But then the Russian forces have also had some success to where they have retaken some of this area. And you see that going on really all over the place. But especially, this is important, the Russians have done a lot to make certain that the Ukraine doesn't go any further on the left flank or on the right flank, uh, especially all during this area down here. And that is uh, presents a real problem and a risk to the Ukraine side, because now then, I mean, we're talking this has been since the 6th of August, and that's as far as they've gotten. It was about 18 miles, which sounds like a lot. But when it was lightly defended and they rushed out there, but now then the problem is now what? I mean, they have already allegedly suffered between six to 7,000 killed, and they keep moving more forces in there. But they can't hold this forever because Russia obviously has the numerical advantage. And by holding the flanks here, and that means that Ukraine is continuing to send more troops in, and they have you know a couple of successes on the sides here in the north. But what that's doing is extending their supply lines even further, and it puts the whole force at risk of another pincer movement. If Russia should move enough forces into here, in here especially, and move along the border, they could cut this off and, again, place thousands of Ukraine troops in the position to where they either have to withdraw or risk getting cut off and destroyed. 
And you so you see this is happening now all across the front line, uh, even in the uh, the area here north of Kharkiv. There's still uh, R- Russia still is maintaining offensive movements here or at least battles which require the Ukraine side to keep keep forces up here. So Ukraine has to fight uh, up here in the Kursk area where they attack some along the north of Kharkiv area here. And then there's additional fighting here in the Kupiansk area, uh, all the way in, into this area in, in the middle part of it, uh, certainly in the Pokrovsk area. We talked about this is the Turetsk area in this direction. Uh, and then now there's additional with, with Vuglodar down uh, in the south is also coming under increasing pressure. And the Ukraine side is at risk of having that force cut off, and they may have to withdraw from that as well. You see, it's it's literally like the, the the boy with the finger in the dock. Where do you pull troops from, from one force to try and stop another? And everywhere the Ukraine side has pulled their troops, the Russians are making advances. And so if something has been a, a not that big of a, of a force uh, or not that big of a push, Ukraine thinks, well, maybe we can thin out this line to go into another area here, like in the, the, the Pokrovsk area where the risk is danger. But all it's done is slow down the Russians here. But now then, as soon as they pull troops out of one area to go to the other, Russia increases the pressure there. And now then they start to lose it here. The Ukraine side has put up a tremendous defense of, of, of Uglodar really for the, the duration of the war. Russia several times has tried to take it, but they have been repulsed every single time. But now then, Ukraine is just running out of troops. They don't have enough. And we're going to see in a minute how some even of the of the uh, pro-Ukrainian sites have been talking about that, uh, that Ukraine just doesn't have enough of any category of anything you need to fight a war. But then we're going to get into the situation to where you see things are just kind of weird on the Western side. Now, all of these things to any to any rational thinking, non-emotional thinking person, you can see when all of these things are going bad, then then that should lead to some rational decisions also to where you have to acknowledge reality and make reasonable decisions that can at least minimize the damage and preserve your your side's strengths and other assets if you if you have them. That's what should happen. But that's not what is happening. It's not going to be a shock to you if you've been watching our channel for any amount of time. Uh, but let, let me show you what some of the, the pro-Ukrainian side uh, people have been following this. One, one of the key ones is a guy named Julian Rupka. Uh, he's a German a, a, a guy who's on Twitter, but he's also a, a, been following this war very, very closely. His, uh, his tweets uh, he's definitely are for Ukraine side, but he's also distinguished himself as being honest about things. Well, this is a, a Google Translate uh, translation of his. It, most of his tweets are in German. Some are in English. This particular one was in German. Uh, but a couple of things I want to point out here is he's talking about in Vuglodar. Uh, he said, to the north of this, Toresk is the focus of the Russian army. Not only there. The Russian offensive efforts are also being made in Chesiv Yar. I didn't even point that out on the map, but that's another one where the pressure is continuing to push the Ukraine back to the west. And for the first time in almost two years, there is also an advance in Luhansk and eastern Kharkiv up in the the, uh, Kupiansk area. The Ukrainian army has a whole series of problems it is currently unable to deal with. Geographically, it is very thin. But there, and he says, because of course, uh, but there are also too many fresh and therefore inexperienced soldiers, too few capable leaders, personnel, and and of course, the well known disaster far too little Western support in the form of weapons and ammunition. In some, the problems are so big that Russia itself is going crazy with its own problems at a rate not seen since the summer of 2022. By the way, that's a translation issue there. What what he said when you read the original German was he said Russia is going crazy with their advances, their problems of trying to solve the Ukraine side is what he meant there at a rate not seen since the summer of 2022. That was my point before. And that's why so many people are are fleeing from the Ukraine side, because it's like, man, the Russians are moving faster and faster with all of this. Um, but Gary put that, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of other things I want to point out that he said the Ukraine soldiers that he speaks to, cause he's had lots of contact with the, the Ukraine side can hardly explain the catastrophe. Uh, and then, then that last part where I've circled there, he said, just in case the usual Russian trolls come out, uh, of their fire extinguishers again, nobody's thinking about surrendering. Instead, they are already mentally preparing for the defense of the Dnipro. That is a huge admission here. 
uh, he's he he's kind of saying, hey, all the trolls who said, oh, the Ukraine's going to surrender and they're going to give up. He said, nah, forget about it because they're already mentally preparing to defend against the Dnipro. Let me show you what that means and why that's kind of a big admission here, uh, because the the Dnipro River is back here, the Dnipro River, and, and it turns into Dnipro here. But you see, you see where that is, right? That's halfway back in the country. All of this area would have to come back. And if the Ukraine side is already thinking about withdrawing to this, and this is this is the strongest natural defensive barrier in the country because it's a very large river and very, very defensible from that side. But you would have to withdraw, look at that, like hundreds of kilometers to get back to here. And if they're even thinking about that, that just tells you just how serious things are for the Ukraine side. Now, any rational person would say, okay, all of those things that Rupka just mentioned here are, are on the, the negative side. And it's it, you can't fix these. This is like trying to build a ship. It, it takes years to do. You can't just undo these kinds of things and solve them in, in a week or two or even probably even a year or two. This would These are long-term situations in the best of circumstances, i.e. when you're not being attacked in your country. So these are the worst of circumstances, meaning... In all practical terms, they cannot be reversed. So we should take action based on that reality. But uh, there's another uh, relatively pro-Ukraine side uh, guy who's an analyst, a guy named Emil Kostelim, Kostelmi. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, Gary, if you could put that one up there. He, he says he, he had a long uh, Twitter thread yesterday. And he says, simply put, the Ukrainian defenders don't seem to be in full control of the situation. Ukrainian sources are speaking about multiple simultaneous issues such as lack of manpower and ammo, problems with coordination, failed rotations, bad leadership, and so on. I cannot more strongly tell you how, how fatal, fatal that is, that combination of things he said, which is similar to what Rupka was saying a minute ago, for any army. These are not just tactical setbacks. This is not just, well, things aren't going well for us today, but tomorrow, think— these are fundamental issues here. You can't win if you don't have enough personnel, if you don't have enough trained personnel, if you don't have enough leaders, if you don't have enough ammunition or weapons, and they don't have the capacity to do that. When was the last time you heard about any big shipments from the West uh, to, to give to Ukraine? All the, the reports have been saying, and we chronicled many of them here, that all of this operation in the Korsk area in the north has chewed up huge numbers of previously trained and capable uh, offensive capability for the Ukraine side. Hundreds of combat vehicles that they no longer have have been lost by some estimates over 500, possibly even more. And of course, as I showed you there a second ago, if they're going to hold it, they have to continue feeding into that which explains why the Russians are in no hurry to, to quell that because by keeping those flanks covered uh, and, and, and limiting any penetration and in, in incrementally to the north, that means everything stays within their range of their drones, with their artillery, and with their rocket fire. And they are just slowly just decimating everything that goes in there. There is no rational hope to hold this. By all of all rights, Ukraine should withdraw from there. Well, by all rights, they should never have gone in there because this was incredibly predictable. But now that they did, they should withdraw them immediately to seal off this and stop this pointless loss of troops every day. It makes no sense whatsoever if you have any idea, ever hope of holding on to any of the territory that you currently possess. But that just doesn't seem to be in, in the case because uh, here's what we have on the Western side. Now, I've told you what they should do, what any rational analyst who's not looking at it emotionally, but just realistically, what they would do. They would seek a negotiated settlement. They would withdraw from Kursk. They would take what manpower they have and put it in the Eastern Front to make it much more difficult and slow down the Russians while they're doing negotiations to try to get the best deal that they can. Let me show you what they are thinking. Now, here's some of the thinking from uh, from some of the uh, key people in the West that shows you how we are continuously and remain unwilling to acknowledge what's going on on the ground in reality. Here's a former White House advisor on Fox News this weekend. 
I think it absolutely must be part of a strategic plan that we have, not only for achieving an end state, as I mentioned just now, and a path for achieving it, but far less discussed is for the day after. Look, after this war ends, which you know it will end at some point, Ukraine will be rightfully armed to the teeth with American and allied technology, and we want it to, be, to continue to serve as a deterrent against a major strategic adversary, and we want, at the same time, to ensure that our technology is protected from landing in the wrong hands. So we absolutely must give Ukraine what it needs to achieve victory and must make that be a part of a broader strategy, not only for the end state of ending the war, but also the day after that. And, and I should just add one thing, you know, doing that, even announcing that there are day after discussions taking place, not only would allay uh, many Americans reasonable questions about the direction of our assistance, but actually could serve as a meaningful deterrent itself, mm. just that announcement. Oh my God! I I could not believe when I when I saw that video. I had to watch it a couple of times to see maybe I maybe I misunderstood what he said. But that is as delusional as it gets. You, you're saying that now, two and a half years into the war, we need to figure out what the, what our objectives are supposed to be. And and he's going to talk on that in a minute. I'm going to show you another clip momentarily uh, where he goes into somewhat more detail on that. But in his last comment there that we need to be thinking about the day after that, of course, the war is going to end and Ukraine is going to be armed to the teeth. Do you not understand how wars work? If Ukraine loses, there's only going to be a, an issue of surrender terms. That's all it's going to be. There won't be a Ukraine armed to the teeth. There might not be a Ukraine, at least not in the form that exists right now. That's far more likely than any kind of negotiated settlement, which they're not even seeking at the moment, by the way. They're continuing to try to put pressure on Russia and continuing to fight in the east, continuing to keep this, this hopeless issue going in the north with the Kursk, which just cannot succeed. So there is complete detachment from reality on the Ukraine side and on the, the American side. Now, you may not even know who that guy is, but he was hired by the White House at one point. He's a White House advisor. So he's he's somebody that, uh, you know, it, some people in the, in the administration once thought was smart enough to put in there. That's scary. But here's another one uh, who's on TV all the time. Former four star general, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Holy cow. Watch this. Let's give them all that they can possibly use and then enable them to achieve everything that they possibly can, change the dynamics of this war so that there can be some kind of meaningful negotiations and get the guns to go silent, provide rock solid security guarantees for Ukraine, get them into the EU, and then allow Ukraine to, to flourish as continued independent democracy uh, that embraces free market capitalism. And I, for one, don't believe that we can't do all of this and Indo-Pacific and help in the Middle East. I believe we have to. Wow. That, that is so detached from any kind of reality. Folks, let me, let me just tell you, don't listen to this man. I, I mean, whether, whether you're just a person sitting at home, if you're a, 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 an aide for a congressional office, if you're somebody in the White House, run from this man. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. And if you listen to him, you will definitely harm America's national interest. If anyone in any position of authority listens to this man, we are in real trouble. Because, I mean, let's just look at the thing. Again, two and a half years into the war, he says we need to change the dynamics by giving them, Ukraine side, everything they're asking for. We've already given them everything that we possibly can spare, and we've ramped up our production, you know, capabilities, you know, as much as we can without going on to a full our own kind of wartime footing, which we haven't done so far. And the amount that we have is incremental, so it's never, never going to be enough to change the dynamics. Again, if it hadn't in two and a half years of war, by what possible rationale should anyone think that now it's going to? Then he says that we need to give security guarantees to Ukraine. Insane. Are you kidding me? Decide that it's likely to lose a war, not even to have a negotiated settlement on bad terms, but to lose a war. And you know what? Even if they somehow manage to get a good negotiated end of war through negotiations, why in God's name would anyone want to give security guarantees to an, an unstable country like this with next door to a nuclear superpower so that if that ever heats back up again and the war kicks back off, 
you're on the hook. So now then you're going to be fighting and you're going to be dying for them. And, and, and there's every reason to think that in that scenario that he drew, that would almost certainly happen again. But it's unlikely that it's going to come to that because the Russian side shows no interest right anymore of actually having a negotiated settlement after this incursion into Kursk and then the advancement uh, of the U.S. weapons and Western weapons being given freedom to fire into Russia. Now then Putin says he's not interested in that. He wouldn't even he said, actually, I think it was yesterday. He won't even talk about peace anymore. No negotiations until all of the Ukrainian side is off of his territory. And most likely because of what we see progressing now throughout uh, the Eastern Front and, and especially given the knowledge that Russia is increasing their military capacity, there's no way that they're going to negotiate from a position of strength to the side that's in, give anything to the side that's on the weak side. Nobody's going to do that. Last of all, uh, Vladimir Putin. So when he's talking about uh, Petraeus, given security guarantees, run, run from that. Don't listen to him at all. Uh, then he's, of course, he's, he's talking about seeking negotiations. Interesting that he now claims that because this is the same guy that's been saying that was saying and most infamously in, in May, I think it was May 31st of 2023, uh, right before the Ukraine side launched its ill-fated 2023 uh, offensive uh, into the teeth of the Russian defenses. Um, he said that the, the Ukraine side was going to succeed. They had, you know, air power. They had infantry. They had uh, artillery, uh, engineering support, and that they would penetrate the Russian lines and they would crack and they would crumble on the Russian side and potentially go all the way to the Azov coast. He was very confident of that. And of course, none of it happened. It, predictably, none of it happened. And so now then the same guy who was talking about victory now is talking about change the dynamics so that we can get to negotiated settlement. Well, that's absurd. You had a negotiated settlement in, in March and April of 2022. You had the possibility at the end of 2022 and again in 2023 and most recently in this past June where Putin again said, he's will, here's the terms I'm willing to have a negotiated settlement. You've already had that. Just think of how irrational what he's saying is. He wants it to get them into a better position. They were already in the position. And, and this is the kind of advice we're getting from someone who the United States of America put in charge of the CIA. That is shocking how bad his advice is and how irrational what he's saying is. Um, and, then, and, then, and then in case you needed to go just a little further to expose the ridiculousness and the, the emptiness of his uh, capabilities, he actually says, and you know what? We can keep doing this. We can give Ukraine everything they're asking for while we give Israel everything they're asking for, while we give Taiwan everything they want, and keep our own forces capable of defending our, our interests worldwide. Yep, we can do it all because we're American, man. Uh, our uniforms just say U.S. Army on it, you know, for the Army people, U.S. Navy, Air Force, whatever. We, it's got an American flag. Hey, man. We got an American flag on our shoulder. We can do whatever we want, man. We can do it all. Like Biden has said in that clip we keep showing from last uh, last October, where he said, hey, man, we're the most powerful nation in the history of the world. We're not. We are a powerful nation, but we're not the most powerful nation in the history of the world. We're not even the most powerful nation with without constraints right now. And, of course, with Russia getting stronger by the month, with China continuing a decades-long strength, building up of its both economy and military capacity, and now diplomatic and political, they are really moving their weight around. And all of that together means that our options are limited. Now, we can still keep ourselves safe. We're not at risk. It's not like they're going to build up to come and attack us because then that would undo everything that the Chinese have been trying to do, which they want to have influence and, and hegemony in their part of the world. That's what they seek which is not benign to a lot of people out there, but they're not looking to militarily conquer because then that would undo everything that they have done. They seek to avoid war, even with Taiwan, much less with the United States. They don't want war, but they are prepared for it because in the view of many Chinese, according to many experts we've talked to, they think we are coming after them, so they're getting ready for it. But they're not going to initiate it because that would be foolish for them to do and you know, destructive for their outcomes. But we need to make sure that we don't prompt such an attack or that we don't cause them to take a preemptive war because they think we're coming after them. That would be stupid. But people like this are advocating that very thing. Um, and, and interesting enough, that, that so those aren't the only two. But uh, I, I want to show you that Emil uh, Castrelli uh, again a minute ago. 
uh, Castelmi, I'm sorry, uh, because after you saw that uh, part of his tweet I showed you there where he, you know, showed honestly all the things that was part of a long thread where he talked about many of the problems that the Ukraine sides are having. He still says, though, however, the Ukraine are still able to avoid a collapse. Even though there have been local failures, Ukraine hasn't allowed Russia to achieve a breakthrough. There have been rumors about more reserves being sent to Pokrovsk, which could help stabilize the situation. I hope the Ukrainians are able to solve this concerning situation. Okay, hope is not a method, folks. And you can't sit there and paint a very rational, logical picture of why things aren't going good and then just say, but I hope everything works out good. See, the rational person, after he had that long string there, would have then started telling everybody the what they need to do now is try to end this war before they lose even more. And instead, they just keep going down this path here, which makes literally no sense. Now, that's that's not the only one here. Uh, Michael Kaufman and I think it's Rob Lee in Foreign Affairs uh, also came out with a piece that talks about some of the, the realities of what's going on. Uh, but then come to really curious conclusions. Uh, the, they write, the offensive in the Kursk region weakens Ukraine's already shaky front since these experienced brigades are not used in defense, says Foreign Affairs article. According to the publication, uh, the, the, continue, the continuing to defend only Ukraine would have, quote, a good chance of exhausting the Russian offensive while simultaneously solving the personnel problems and stabilizing the front by winter. And then they go on to say, and already in 2025, it would be able to go on the offensive against a weakened Russian force, and the risk would be lower. The, the, basically, in the article, they're saying, hey, you know, the, the Ukraine side shouldn't have gone into Kursk. It's weakened them uh, because if they had to just put these guys in the east, which is what I argued as well, I said it would have slowed down the Russians. But they're saying, hey, Russia's offensive potential is going to run out here pretty soon, and then they're going to culminate, and they're going to stop, and then the Ukraine side can then go on the offensive and run. By what logic? I mean, that is irrational. Again, I can't get away from this. So you've seen the irrational almost all the way across on these key Western people. I, I know that the, the COP and certainly foreign affairs is well, allegedly this has been one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent foreign policy magazine in, in the United States and in the West has been for decades. And now the, this guy in Kaufman is quoted all over the place, Western media, New York Times, Washington Post, everywhere. He's always quoted as the expert. But now then with no explanation, he's saying, despite the, the fact that Ukraine tried this in 2023 and that they built up all of these forces. And in that case, they had some significant successes uh, in late 2022 heading into that fall. And then they had thousands of armored vehicles given to them by the West and all kinds of intelligence support and everything else. Russia was on the, the weekend because they had been they had lost a couple of big battles in 2022. So you're never going to get a better chance of what they had in 2023. And they broke their teeth on the first line of the Russian defenses of five bands. And then they were crushed after that. And ever since that time, ever since their offensive did peter out, probably by October, November of 2023, They've been pushing back all the way. And now, as I showed you at the opening of this, it's picking up steam. It's accelerating. The Russian advance is accelerating. So while I showed you that the people of Ukraine are running away because they see that the Russian onslaught and, and by all these Western accounts, they're moving faster than they have since 2022. You have these guys in foreign affairs trying to tell you that, hey, the Ukraine side can stop the Russians here soon and then go on the offensive in 2025. Where is anyone talking now about giving Ukraine thousands of more armored vehicles? Where is the air force that Ukraine didn't have in 2023 that suddenly they're going to have now? And then of course, like all these people, they keep having the problem of they only look at one part of the equation and they're oblivious to what's happening on the Russian side. The Russian side hasn't been sitting passive. They've done things smart. They've given ground where it makes sense. They've surrendered territory when it makes sense, when they couldn't hold it at a reasonable cost. And they have, out of contact, built up their power militarily. They've built up combat units, entire units. They have expanded their military, their industrial capacity. And because their air defense and their air power are, are both way power more strong than anything the Ukraine side has, they're relatively protected in the Russian side. And their industry is continued to crank out 24-7, 365. So they're given all of the things that you need to, to win at war. 
They're getting the personnel that they need. They're getting trained. They're getting time to train. And they have the air defense systems that they need. Their, their electronic warfare systems are continuing to advance. Uh, and, and, and their long-range missiles are coming in. They're, they're getting new categories of drones. Uh, and they're getting more missiles and, and other help from Iran and from North Korea, which are cranking things out much faster than we are in the West, by the way. Ukraine's getting help from the West, too, but it's at a much lower rate than what the Russian side is getting, what they can produce. Literally everywhere you look, the power on the Russian side keeps growing while the power on the Ukraine side keeps diminishing. And all of it, folks, all of it comes down to manpower. Even if somehow, some miraculous way, the Ukraine side could reverse the, the equipment and the ammunition issues, they can't undo the personnel issues. They have lost so many men. And even by these Western sources, they admit that they don't have enough regular, just bodies, period, but they're not capable, they're not trained, and they don't have the leaders. And without that, folks, nothing else matters. Then tell me why allegedly smart people in the West keep on saying, yeah, keep going and, and try to get an, a, a mythical negotiated settlement at, at the benefit of Ukraine. You're not going to get it. Your chances for that have already come and gone. When you had the chance to do that, you punted. You know, you want to win, they said. And now then we're talking about that, but you don't have the means to do it anymore. Because in order to have a negotiated settlement at your benefit, at the expense of your adversary, you have to be on the upper side power-wise. And that means equipment, ammunition, and personnel. That's gone. It's never coming back. Um and now then we have they have issues like uh, uh, Poland is, is wanting to possibly escalate matters. It, Poland has been angry from the beginning, and they, they have such a strong anti-Russian uh, viewpoint, and many of them hate the Russians for many historical reasons. I won't go into them now. Uh, but now then they said, uh, Gary, if you could put that one uh, headline up there, they're actually saying, this is, I believe, earlier today, they're saying Poland has a duty to shoot down Russian missiles over Ukraine. Over Ukraine, it says they're one of their ministers. And Poland's, Poland and Ukraine's neighbors, countries must shoot down Russian missiles approaching the airspace despite NATO opposition, says the Polish foreign minister. He, he went on to talk about in there how I, I know NATO doesn't want to do this stuff, but ultimately we got to do what makes sense for us. Well, tell me again what makes sense by potentially escalating the war by drawing Poland into it. Because if Poland attacks Russian air uh, sorties and, and missiles and, and uh, other kinds of uh, aerial assets inside Ukraine from NATO countries, I, I, I think that you are rolling the dice and gambling to think that Russia is not going to retaliate, not respond, because Russia has been talking more and more openly about willingness to take this into the, to the Western side if they get involved. They keep saying that stuff, but I don't know why no one wants to believe anything they say. I, I guess because they haven't seen Russia do it so far. There's this thought that they just never will. And that is, you know, potentially catastrophic and fatal miscalculation, something that could expand this war. I'm arguing that we should do everything we can to end this, to curtail it, to cut it off and to end the risk. And there's too many people like the Petraeuses, uh, like this fellow on Fox News, uh, like the, the Julian Rupka, not Julian Rupka, but this Emil guy and the other people uh, like, uh, you know, Rob and, uh, and Michael there, they want to expand it. Just keep going, keep giving them things. And, and listen, I, I, I just, and at the end of this, I just want to just reinforce here. There is no path to military victory ever for the Ukraine side. It doesn't exist. There presently is no possibility for Ukraine to avoid defeat because all of the fundamentals, take the emotion out of it, that go into making war and the war-making potential are all, all on Russia's side. The only thing we can do is to expand the war and to draw others into it and make other people and other nations and other troops and other civilians be killed in the process. So it is possible to expand the war, but the expansion still is not going to defeat Russia because they have the nuclear card to play. And by all accounts, whether from Lavrov or from Ryabkov or from Putin himself, they appear to be willing to use nuclear weapons. 
whatever the cost. They don't want to, but they seem to be really firm that if it escalates and they do get into a war with the West, that they're willing to use tactical nuclear weapons. And there is no reason to even toy with that. Everything that we should be doing is to curtail this, to cut it and cut it and get it off the table so that the risk no longer uh, exists. The West can continue to have security. The West can continue to, to do whatever it needs to do economically, security wise uh, to end the war and have peaceful lives. So we, all that is still possible as long as we don't continue down this road of stupidity. Th that's what all of these things are, because if there's no rational way to militarily win a, a conflict, why would you want to keep going with it? And, and the only reason that I mean, that should be a rhetorical question. Unfortunately, it isn't because they're not willing to engage in reality. We don't want that outcome. We don't want Russia to win. We don't want them to succeed in any way. OK, I get that. I get that you don't want them to, but you, your chance to actually make something like that happen expired in the early part of this war. You, it's gone now because of your unwillingness to do what is rational and reasonable earlier on. You could have succeeded the West, could have succeeded in their objective, as reprehensible as it is, wanting to just harm Russia at the expense of the Ukrainian people and land. But that was in your power to do earlier in the war with these negotiated settlements. It could have been happened in Istanbul in, in March, April 2022. That's what could have happened, but it didn't. And now then all those possibilities are gone. So now then it's either accept a, a, a bad outcome or foolishly keep going and accept catastrophe because this could get a lot worse. I pray to God it doesn't. But that's where we are. So that is the truth, folks, no matter what you're going to hear anywhere else. All kinds of this nonsense that I've shown you here today from the West. Don't believe it. Run from people like David Petraeus because they're going to get you killed. That's the bottom line. Thanks for joining with us today, folks. I always appreciate you. Be sure and like and subscribe. Uh, and, and also, uh, we're, we're now uh, expanding into uh, podcasts because I know a lot of you don't have the ability to watch every show on video or some people, you know, don't even like to. They, they like to listen, but they want to know what we have to say. Uh, we're now virtually anywhere you have podcasts. You can find us there. So thank you very much. And we will be seeing you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.